Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Last time, we discussed the mutiny aboard the frigate Charles II. The seizure of that fantastic vessel from her owners at Spanish Expedition Shipping and her rightful captain, Charles Gibson. In the initial stages of the mutiny, three characters really stand out. There was the carpenter, John Guy. He's the one who cut the anchor cables on the night of the mutiny, the man who clapped a pistol to the second mate, John Gravitt, when he attempted to raise the alarm, the same man who threatened the doctor with the loss of a leg. Then there was William May, the ship's steward, the sailor who requested that his contract be cancelled when rumors that they were going to be sold into slavery began to spread. And when his request was officially denied, who added fuel to the fire of those rumors. And then finally there was, of course, Henry Every, the one-time naval officer and first mate of Charles II. He was either the mastermind behind the whole operation, or he was the officer best suited to lead once the other officers had been dealt with. It depends on who you ask there, and that's true for a lot of this story, for this voyage in general. There are a lot of stories about Henry Every and the voyage to come, and many of them can just be dismissed out of hand. They're just a part of the myth that was built up around Henry Every. But some are less easy to dismiss, and concerning the mutiny, there are two versions of that story. The first version comes down to us from the officers who were there, primarily Captain Gibson and his second mates. The other version comes to us from the mutineers. In particular, from the testimony of six mutineers who would sail away under Henry Every. Now, occasionally, the two versions of events will corroborate each other. But just as often, they contradict each other. We might expect the magistrates at the time, those who took these stories down, to side entirely with the officers, the legitimate officers. And for the most part they did, but it wasn't a completely biased hearing. In what proved to be kind of a shocking twist to those in power, public opinion proved to be a major factor in this trial. And it tilted, shockingly, toward the pirates on trial. The job of that court and the people of England and subsequent historians was to distill those two stories down to one single and cohesive narrative. And to some extent, that's what we're going to do here today, but I also want to show both sides of the coin. This is episode 204, A Man of Fortune, or A Tale of Two Mutinies. Let's begin with Captain Charles Johnson's record in A General History of the Pirates. As usual, Johnson gets a few facts wrong. For example, the story of the drunken boatswain. We know that, is the drunken boatswain aboard, was a signal given by somebody from the Charles to sailors aboard the James and the Dove. A signal that the mutiny was on. Captain Johnson tells us, on the other hand, that it was a signal given to Henry Every that the mutiny was on. And that's, you know, not right. But it's not a complete fabrication, as are so many other versions of this story. Johnson also tells us about the punch on which Captain Gibson got so very drunk and passed out. That's true. But then he calls the Charles II repeatedly the Duke. And that's false. Now this might be some confusion over Every's naval record. One of Henry Every's first jobs in the Royal Navy was possibly aboard a ship called the Duke under Rear Admiral John Narborough. But most of this is surface-level stuff. More significant is Captain Charles Johnson's claim that the Duke quietly slipped out of the harbor at Acarunia. And that's just not true. The James fired on the Charles, and then the shore batteries of Acarunia fired at the Charles, and then a small armada of coastal vessels chased the Charles into the Atlantic Ocean. Everyone, 
From the officers on board to the mutineers to even the Spanish officials there on the docks agree on all of that. And it's a significant point. Later on, Every's going to tell the world that he intended to put any man who did not want to sail with him ashore at A Coruña, safe, sound, and free from any accusations of collusion or piracy. But he was unable to do so because the James fired on them. They were forced to flee from the harbor. And then Johnson mentions a Dutch vessel at anchor there in A Coruña, a ship that declined to chase Henry Avery and the Charles II down. Now, that's true, that did happen, but what Johnson fails to mention here is that this Dutch vessel was herself an alleged pirate. The testimony of a one John Sparks, one of the mutineers from the Charles, mentions a, quote, Benjamin Gunning, belonging to a pirate then at Coruña, end quote. According to Sparks, Benjamin Gunning was one of the ringleaders of the operation, along with other names like Robert Ritchie and Henry Adams, the quartermaster, and Anthony Track, and of course, Henry Every. But the only ship that could be considered a pirate at the time at A Coruña, besides all of the mutineers, was a Dutch privateer named Captain Minheer. There's very little known about Captain Minheer in the record. But his name does tend to pop up from time to time. It's unclear even if it's the same. Privateer, Captain Mean here, but from Tortuga, under Lauro de Graff and Michel de Grammont, to all the way to the end of the Golden Age, some 40 years later, at St. Mary's on Madagascar. Minier, or all of the Dutch captains sharing the name, all seem to have sailed under the radar. He did so with a commission whenever he was able, but he was out there. And I just want to note that the world of the pirates is filled with ships like this one. Small operators who never gained the infamy of the big names or the wealth of the big names, but nonetheless they were sailing and preying on small merchantmen all the way from America to Indonesia. There's a lot of these out there. But it's what Captain Charles Johnson next tells us that I want to focus on. Once the Charles was out to sea, probably somewhere around midnight to maybe 2 a.m., he writes, quote, The captain, Gibson he means, who by this time was awaked by either the motion of the ship or the noise of working the tackles, rung the bell. Avery and two others went into the cabin. The captain, half asleep and in a kind of fright, asked what was the matter. Avery answered coolly, Nothing. The captain replied, Something's the matter with the ship. Does she drive? What weather is it? Thinking nothing less than that it had been a storm and that the ship was driven from her anchors. No, no, answered Avery. We're at sea with a fair wind and good weather. At sea, says the captain. How can that be? Come, says Avery. Don't be in a fright, but put on your clothes and I'll let you into a secret. You must know that I am captain of this ship now, and this is my cabin. Therefore, you must walk out. I am bound to Madagascar with the design of making my own fortune, and that of all the brave fellows joined with me. The captain, having a little recovered his senses, began to apprehend the meaning. However, his fright was as great as before. With Avery perceiving, bade his fear nothing, for, says he, if you have a mind to make one of us we will receive you, and if you turn sober and mind your business, perhaps in time, I may make you one of my lieutenants. If not, there's a boat alongside, and you shall be set ashore. End quote. Now, that's some good color, a bit of fun dialogue, but we don't know what actually happened in the captain's chamber. Some of what Johnson wrote there is based on testimony, but it's kind of like what movie trailers mean when they say inspired by true events, not really what happened at all. The best we can say here is that once the Charles was about two leagues out to sea, that's seven miles or eleven kilometers, at that point Henry Every went to Captain Gibson's cabin and informed him of the mutiny. 
E.T. Fox suggests that Every was probably polite to the captain. He had, after all, been his boss only a couple of hours earlier, and Every treated English officers with a degree of respect all throughout his career. Captain Gibson himself would later tell a tribunal that Henry Every offered him command of the voyage, if, that is, he agreed to turn pirate. Another officer on board tells us that Every suggested they switch ranks. Every would take the captaincy, but Captain Gibson could become the first mate. Now all of that is possible, but we should take it with a grain of salt. That other officer wasn't there in the room. He was merely retelling a version of events as told by Captain Gibson. And Gibson himself was an alcoholic. And he was going to be fired and briefly imprisoned for his role in this disaster. That tribunal I mentioned, well, they found his testimony suspect. And we should treat it similarly. We do know, though, what happened between Henry Every and the two second mates on board. There was David Cray. He's the man who happened upon Henry Every, William May, and John Guy after their dinner with the captain, when they were sharing a round of the punch that got the captain so very drunk, and when William May proposed a toast to the health of the captain and the prosperity of their voyage. It was only in hindsight that David Cray realized the captain in that toast was not Charles Gibson, but Henry Every. Then there was John Gravett. He was the one leading the watch on the night of the mutiny. After his meeting with Captain Gibson, Henry Every met with both men. First came Gravett. Henry Every went to his cabin, which was under guard, and asked him, I suppose you do not intend to go with us. Gravett assured Henry Every that he did not intend to accompany them, and Henry Every left. He returned to the deck to man the helm, and took the Charles a full ten miles, or three leagues, out to sea. There, Henry Every and some of the other crewmen scanned the horizon with their spy glasses, and that's worth a note as well. The telescope, as we would recognize it, had only been invented about twenty years earlier. The obvious naval applications were pretty immediately recognized by the English, and it was the war, this Nine Years' War, that saw them put into mass production. Now, there have probably, or, you know, maybe, been spy glasses on other pirate ships by this point, but the Spanish expedition was well-funded and well-supplied. You know, they had the best food, the best guns, and several spy glasses on board. And the use of those telescopes is noted in more than a few instances. They were still so new and so novel that they were worth a mention. They were cutting-edge technology. I have to suspect that those spy glasses gave this ship, a pirate ship that was about to become the most infamous pirate ship in history up to that point, I suspect that their spy glasses did give them an advantage. Once they were all confident that nobody was following them, Every ordered the sails furled to give the crew time to sort out their affairs. But before they could begin their council at the mast, second mate David Cray left his cabin and made his way to the quarter deck, where Henry Every and John Guy were. Every was at the helm, but when Cray arrived, Every broke off and took Cray by the hand. Their exchange was noted by everyone on board, and it's well known. Every said, Will you go with me? And Cray replied, I do not know your design. And at this point, Henry Every stared him down. A tense moment passed, a moment in which all of the respect, all of the polite and amicable conversation that Henry Every had been noted for, all of it seemed to leave him. The possibility of real violence seemed imminent. But then Henry Every relaxed, at least a bit, he said that there were few who knew his intentions.
Lawrence. David Cray asked for their names. He said perhaps he could ask them about their plans. Now this was a clever move. Cray was playing it off like he might still join. But really, he was trying to learn who was in on this mutiny from the beginning, to learn who was to blame and who he could report should he return to land. But Henry Every was crafty. He replied, You will all know by tomorrow morning, eight o'clock at which point John Guy led David Cray away from the helm. But before they left the deck, John Guy turned to Cray and said, in a manner that Stephen Johnson describes as a body, Shakespearean tone, Do you not see this cock? By which he means, you know, a rooster. Henry Every standing there calm and in command, in, in charge. Do you not see this cock? And Cray replied, I do. This man and old May, and Knight, I can trust with anything. They are true cocks of the game, and old sportsmen. If you do not go down, I will knock you on the head. Now when he says, go down, he means to go below decks. Apparently, thanks to his exchange with Henry Every, Mr. Cray was no longer a welcome guest above decks. On his way down, William May, the man that Mr. Guy had called Old May, William May saw David Cray there at the hatch, and confronted him. What do you do here? he asked. And this was a moment fraught with even more peril than that between Cray and Every. Apparently, David Cray said nothing and just continued below, maybe acting like he didn't know that May was addressing him. But at that point, William May drew his pistol, shoved David Cray against a rail, held the pistol to his forehead, and yelled, God damn you! You deserve to be shot through the head! Now, I imagine that Mr. Cray was not aware of the stipulation, on Every's part, that no officers, or any Englishmen indeed, be harmed in the mutiny. Had he known, it certainly would have comforted him, but it sure saved his life here. Cray was not shot through the head. He was led to his cabin and put back under guard. The Charles II spent the rest of that night in a tense but peaceful, quiet calm. No one rose up against the mutineers, and no one was harmed. And come dawn, or a little bit later, around eight o'clock, whenever he said everyone would know his design, the mutineers brought the entire crew on deck. They were surrounded by, and under guard of, armed mutineers, but Captain Gibson was, well, you know, I suppose he should be Mr. Charles Gibson. Mr. Gibson stood before Captain Henry Every, and Captain Henry Every proved true to his word. He informed the amassed crew of his intentions on this voyage. There are several accounts of what he said, but every single account agrees on one phrase. I am a man of fortune, and must seek my fortune. This is maybe the most famous quote in the history of the Golden Age of Piracy. And it became famous very, very quickly. It captured the minds and the imaginations of a generation of English-speaking people all around the world. It led to the adoption of the phrase gentlemen of fortune as a kind of polite shorthand for pirate. But while it was said by Henry Every and is attributed today to Henry Every, he didn't invent that saying. Everyone there knew exactly what he meant when he said, I am a man of fortune. The concept was ancient, but still familiar. Henry Every was turning pirate. Mr. Gibson said simply, I am sorry this happens at this time. Apparently, Henry Every made one last offer to Charles Gibson to give him an officer's role or maybe even command of the voyage, but Gibson refused. Gibson says he said, No, I never thought you would have served me so, who have been so kind to all of you. And to go on a design against my owner's orders, I will not do it. And that probably captures the gist of what he really said, but that last strikes a bit hollow to me that bit about my owner's orders. Now, 
Captain Gibson was kind to his crew. He made life better for all of the men on the Charles II that were stuck in Acarunia, but Gibson really wasn't the problem here. In fact, they might actually have let him take command had he been willing to do so. The problem was the owners. Those owners he mentioned so conspicuously in his testimony, it wasn't a question of a tyrannical captain. This isn't mutiny on the bounty. In fact, there were earlier plans to spare Captain Gibson of the infamy that he would earn in losing such a fine vessel. While the crew was still stuck in Acarunia, there was talk of going on strike. Now, the concept of work stoppages was not new, but the idea of going on strike was somewhat new, and it's originally a maritime concept, and it originates from just about this period in time. The very word striking or to strike comes from this era. Say that a crew was embarked on a voyage and they were being mistreated. One of their few recourses could be to strike the sails. If every man refused to set the sail or to let anyone else do so, their voyage would grind to a halt. And this kind of thing had happened before, but here in the Nine Years' War, when the royal navies of England and the Netherlands and France and Spain, when everyone around the world was relying on crews that were largely impressed into service, work stoppages, or what they called colloquially strikes, became a real problem. But a strike wouldn't have worked in Acarunia. They were already at anchor in a harbor. They didn't need to set sails. The sails were already struck. Hence, mutiny. Mr. Gibson was not alone in his choice to leave the Charles II. His two second mates, Gravett and Cray, well, they were there with him. And William Dampier actually lists a number of others later on, the, the ship's master and her pilot, the barber, the boatswain, a number of third mates, and around nine regular seamen chose to go ashore with Gibson. The Charles II held over 150 crewmen at 8 a.m., and only 17 chose to go with Gibson. Their ship's boat, a pinnace, could have held far more than that, maybe as many as 50 sailors. But they ran into a serious problem. The Charles II was 10 miles out to sea, and that pinnace was the very same that had a hole shot through her hull the night before. Now, no one really seems to agree whether or not the crew was aware of it, at this point, at least, some seem to have been aware, and some weren't. William May would later claim that he only chose to sail on with Every because of the leaky pinnace. Now, his word is questionable, but there were others who were in the same boat. William Bishop, the 18-year-old sailor on his first voyage, would make similar claims. He also said he was forced on to the Spanish expedition against his will, well before ideas of piracy ever even sprouted. And imagine you were in that courtroom or reading the papers, and you've got a young lad forced from his home to sail for villains like James Hublone or Charles Gibson, then forced to choose between risking death on a leaky boat or a life of piracy. Hearts all around England dutifully would melt, but more on that later. For now, every man had a decision to make. Leaky boat or piracy? Riches or death? A drunk captain on a tiny pinnace or a true cock with the finest ship on the sea? What their reasons were behind the choices they make for most of the crew we really can't know. For a very few who will tell the court, well... We know what they say, but their testimony is questionable. But there were a few die-hard pirates, and we definitely know what they thought. In the end, whatever their reasons may have been, almost 150 men chose to sail on with Henry Every. They chose a life of liberty, fortune, and ease. Whether they really wanted to be there or not, they did choose to take part in everything that is to come. And in that, they share at least some part of the guilt and the fame. But there are two notable exceptions to this. 
First, there was the ship's doctor. When Henry Avery announced that anybody who wished to leave was welcome to do so, the doctor wanted to leave, but he wasn't allowed to. There was a pretty hot debate over this point. Avery appears to have pushed to allow the doctor to go, but in the end, the doctor stayed. And then there was another man. Last time, immediately before the mutiny was to take place, while Avery and William May dined with Captain Gibson, I mentioned a mysterious summons reaching a man on shore, the ship's cooper, that is, you know, a barrel maker. The cooper was called to come aboard immediately, and he did so. And reportedly here, he was not given a choice either. He was forced to sail with the pirates. Now, the reason for forcing a doctor to stay may be obvious. You know, you need a surgeon. But the cooper was even arguably more important. Barrels aren't easy to make. They take a fair amount of training and experience. And barrels were really necessary on board a ship. They held food and other goods, but more important than all of it, they held fresh water. And this voyage was unlikely to lay anchor in a friendly port city for maybe years. It would be nothing but lonely islands and abandoned coastline or enemy territory or open ocean. If their barrels began to fail, or they began to rot, or they were lost to sea, or any of a hundred problems happened, the crew would absolutely need someone who knew what they were doing to reliably replace them. Their lives very much depended on it. So the cooper was made to stay. Before the men that had elected to leave climbed down into their pinnace, John Gravitt requested his sea chest. He was refused his chest, but Henry Avery did relent at least a bit. He sent men below decks to collect his officer's coat and his commission. It was a show of maybe empathy. But more than anything, especially to the people who heard about this move, it showed honor in the new captain. But while Gravett waited for his coat and his commission, he was pulled aside by William May. May asked him, and I'm going to say this as deadpan as possible, May asked John Gravett to tell my wife I love her. And this interaction, maybe more than any other, represents the two mutinies we mentioned. Two versions of the same moment. In one telling, in Gravett's recollection, William May was jovial and jocular, and tell my wife I love her, it was a man who was about to enjoy the murder and theft he was about to embark upon. But in the other, in William May's own version, he was dismayed at his circumstances. He genuinely wanted John Gravett to tell his wife he loved her because he might not ever get to see his wife again. This was going to be a question of some import for William May in just a few years' time, but for now, we'll leave that question open. With that last interaction and with his coat and commission, those seventeen men were prepared to set off in their pinnace. But there was one last drama to play out. As their boat pulled away from the Charles, the men on board noticed a leak. Their boat was filling with water. It suggests that at least those who chose to go weren't aware of that fact. It was sure to sink in a matter of minutes if they weren't able to bail it out, and they did not have a bucket. Mr. Gibson called out to the Charles. He asked the pirates to toss them a bucket or a ladle or anything that they could use to bail out their boat. And the pirates at the rail, including John Guy and William May, well, they laughed at those in the pinnace. They taunted them. They, you know, wished them a pleasant voyage. But then, from the helm, Henry Avery intervened. He marched down from the quarterdeck and clapped the carpenter on the ear. He admonished the men, and instilled in them a sense of shame and even, if we are to believe some of the sources, a sense of patriotism. The men at the rail, chagrined, threw a bucket to Gibson and the pinnace. They were therefore able to make it to land in Spain and eventually on to England. And once there, and we will talk more about their return to England, but once they got there, they told their stories to the Admiralty Court. 
And then every newspaper and every broadsheet and every gossip rag told those stories to all of England and beyond. And those moments of honor and kindness in Every's conduct endeared him to many in the English-speaking world. Now, as we will see, according to at least our modern morality, Henry Every probably did not deserve that praise. But at the time, it built a myth around him, and it was a myth that Henry Every purposefully played upon. The navy man turned mutineer turned pirate began to transform into something more. Into a folk hero, a, a working class hero. Kind of a maritime Robin Hood for the age of the English Empire. In every publication that mentioned him, and every publication mentioned him, but they all called him by his chosen title, not just a mere pirate, but a gentleman of fortune. Next time, we're going to continue on with Henry Avery and the crew of the, well, of their ship. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd like to thank everyone who has helped to support the show. Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon or left us ratings or reviews or just recommended this show. You all make this possible. Thank you. Our theme music, as always, was The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you have not checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. And as always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.